I mean, I have more batteries, but. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we are. Mobile. Mobile. <laughs> We're doing something different this mobile. time. We got to make use of available time. We are killing birds with stones, is what they say, and uh, we're currently passing uh, quite a bunch of uh, beautiful windmills on our way to where? Windmills, taking out birds, see it happening in real time. <laughs> uh, where are we headed to? Uh, we are going to go build an RZR Pro. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of parts in the back of the trailer. Got the full throttle XP Pro on the back, and. Uh, Got a ton of work to do to that thing to get it ready because in, I think, about four days, it has to be on trail, on camera, looking beautiful as ever. And, I mean, we'll get it done. Rich has the ultimate set of tools. So we're heading off to Octane Toy Box. We're going to be wrenching on this Pro XP4. Um, and this is the new full throttle car to go to trade shows and do the show circuit and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then you're going to be heading out to uh, some filming on a show. Yeah. And uh, that'll be cool. We uh, look to do forward a little, to that. Yeah. And if we can fit it in, I don't know if we can or not. We got to do a little bit of pre running before the show just to make sure that because uh, the XP Pro is 64 inches, but not for long. Not for long. And, and uh, we got to make sure that that big old limo at 72 inches can get down some of these trails that I plan on taking these guys on because, you know, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm, I'm a competitive dude. And once we started to do some work with, uh, with this particular show, we wanted to make it attractive, really pretty, take them to a very unique area and kind of cover a topic and that being overland that's uh, starting to gain some attraction. So we want to, you know, we want to make an episode that people are going to be searching out. Yeah, so that'll that'll be really cool. Um, yeah, don't mind the bump. <laughs> don't <laughs> we, mind the bumps in the road. We got we got a full load behind us, so yeah. um, the old the old Ford is uh, working good, and uh, we think we got to get some brakes on this bad boy. She's squealing a bit. You know, we've got quite the to do list in a very short <laughs> window while we're over there. Uh, yeah, I got to do some brakes on this thing, and then I we a full river actually. <laughs> the company that I work for is releasing is has just released a new battery and one of the biggest customers that I have is in that area so I actually got to disappear and go and go talk talk shop do some actual work you sure, know that just drag me and, across the state and make me do all your work hey it was all part of my plan so <laughs> hence so hence the caller yeah looking good today big I guy know, right um, so we've had a lot of things happen uh, this last week or two. Um, one of the big things in the industry right now is the R-Max 1000 came out. Yeah, what do you think? Yamaha came out with the next evolution of their Wolverine line UTVs, uh, and it's called the Wolverine R-Max 1000. And uh, a big buildup to this car was they were saying it was trail proven. It was, you know, it was already known to be uh, durable and strong and long lasting and all that other stuff. And that's because it's based off their X2 platform. Yeah. You know, the Wolverine is marketed as sport utility. And I think they're doubling down on it with the R-Max, maybe incorporating a little bit of YXZ DNA into it. And, uh, I've gotten eyes on on it. I, I've seen it r up close and personal, and, and it's it's awfully small. You know, I don't mean that in a bad way whatsoever. I mean, it looks like it's going to be able to get in, out, in and out of some stuff and uh, be a really, really fun and interesting trail rig. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting car because uh, there's a large community of support around the Yamaha Wolverines. The, uh, they're a well-liked vehicle in the industry, and they're um, tough. And they're tough as nails. Uh, they're they're A arms, they're trailing arms, they're all the different components. I mean, they don't have trailing arms, but the the A arm systems in the front and back. Um, you know, they're all beefy. They're all the frames are are stout. Everything about it is pretty stout, and that leads towards a heavier car. It leads towards uh, maybe a little bit less power, things like that. And uh, and this R Max 1000, while it's a new car, uh, it retains some of those uh, notable um, hesitations in production, right? So it's going to be it's going to be a strong chassis, it's going to be a durable chassis, but it's not going to be the fastest car in the world. It's not going to be the most roomy car in the world. Um, it's meant for the person that's just out, 
doing work and then doing fun on the weekends and going, you know, maybe uh, trailering up and going camping and and going down to the fishing spot on the UTV or whatever. It's and not really meant for a, a huge sport expedition. Well, we've got some footage that's already been released of it in a drag race with, I'm not going to name names, but a, a competitor in the sport utility market. Of very, I'll name very, names, KRX. Yeah, and it, it, <laughs> it, it got it. It, it got it, you know, and you and I have spent some time behind the wheel of the KRX, and, you know, it wasn't made to be a speed demon by any means, no. but, uh, you know, the fact that this little sport utility, this little, this little unit that I think, you know, Yamaha America being based out of Georgia, I kind of think it was built and developed for the trail systems out on the East Coast, but it's got a little spunk to it. You know, yeah. if it's beating that car as a sport utility rig, I think guys are going to have a lot of fun on this machine, especially if you can go right and left with it. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an East Coast uh, hot item, you might say. Uh, it's going to be able to turn fairly tight. Um, it has just under 90-inch wheelbase, and uh, it's compatible with you know 33 tires right up from the factory, Yeah. Uh, even up to 35 if you really want to push it. Uh, but with that sort of wheelbase, I don't think going over 33 would be advisable. Right. Um, but uh, it's got some spunk to it. It's not it's not super fast. It's only got 100 and, uh, 110 horsepower, 112, something like well, that. Well, I mean, considering how the, the industry's evolved, it's kind of in line with the naturally aspirated sport machines. You know, it's really close. So, so that's, you know, right in line with the XP1000. Yeah, uh, considering where it's geared, it's going to yeah. be interesting to see how it performs. So it, uh, if we were just to kind of compare it to the industry right now, um, the let's just talk two-seaters, you know, as our general topic here. Uh, compared to the Razor XP1000, you're going to have a similar sized motor. Uh, you're going to have a similar horsepower number. Um, you're probably going to have a little bit of a slower engagement on your clutch than the R RZR would have. Uh, they're a little aggressive. Um, but what you're going to notice is probably the Yamaha is a little bit more, um, a little bit more torquey. Yeah, I, it could be a little bit more torquey. It could be a little bit. I, I don't know if it'll be a little bit more torquey. It's probably going to be, in theory, you know, the Yamaha might wrap out a little bit more than the uh, than the Polaris's. But I feel like this could officially be the death nail of the Havoc. <laughs> That's <laughs> you very know, possible. If this is, if this, I mean, not that the Havoc is really just set, setting the world on fire from a market share standpoint, but the Havoc was. With the exception of some ergonomic stuff, when I got into the Havoc, when I rode the Havoc, I actually really liked it. But there were some things that really kind of stuck out that I that needed to get addressed. And I, had I bought one, I would have addressed. But I really think that this, it's not that Textron was trying to push that Havoc and just gain mark share, market share on it. Because, I mean, when was the last time you saw any sort of Textron Just for marketing? clarity, Textron hasn't pushed anything. Anything, you know, so... <laughs> What it is, whatever they're doing, whatever they're doing with their dealers, whatever they're doing with Tracker, um, the, the the Yamaha coming into the market is not going to do. The one thing where where they may have some advantages there is just in usable space, maybe some cabin space. I haven't really sat in a Tracker, so I don't know. But. They're up in the air a little bit. I think they're going to have some travel advantages, you know, and and it rips. You know, I've been in it. It's it rips. It'll it. You know, I don't know how it keeps up with the Can Am, the Commander. But uh, I've seen it beat the general, so they're they're not slow. The uh, so the Armax uh, does sit high, like you were mentioning with the, the Havoc. Um, it's a little bit of a, a short, tall, boxy vehicle. Yeah, the one that I saw had paddles on it, so I had a bad frame of reference on it. And those paddles that it had on it, they couldn't have been more than 29. So yeah. it was really kind of hard to get an idea how tall it was. Uh, as it sat right there in front of me, it was probably similar stance to my X3. You know, it was kind of a low car. Really? Yeah, it wasn't as big. As, I mean, take it for granted. I'm 6'4", so, you know. The, uh, so if we take a look at uh, the RMX 1000 uh, and compare it to the, like, the General 1000, um, you're going to notice that the General is a lot bigger of a vehicle. It has a bigger wheelbase. has a lot more cabin room. Um, and the the seat nature of it would probably sit a little bit lower in a in a in a general than it would the R Max, um, but uh, just because of the nature of how Polaris seats their their cars. But um, the the R Max is definitely an upright vehicle, and if you've ever sat in an X2 or an X4 um, Wolverine, you would you would know exactly how it feels in the R Max 1000 because it's the same seats, it's the same cage, it's the same frame, it's the same. 
uh, pretty much 75% of that car is the same. Right. And everything below the skid plate is new. Uh, all new tra- trail uh, A arms in front and back. Um, new clearances, new shocks. Uh, and uh, seems to be like it's in a, in my opinion, I think it's going to kill out the X2. I think it's they're going to eventually just drop the X2 because unless that's just going to be their entry level Wolverine. Yeah, I don't think the Vikings going anywhere. It's too cheap, too too affordable, too uh, too tough, and you know for an entry machine for a farmer, it hits all the it, it checks all the boxes. Well, and the and the the Viking is more of a utility focused car. Hundred percent. So you know it's not that we haven't gone out and done adventure ridings on a uh, adventure riding on a Viking because I certainly have. You know I, I've got, I think I've mentioned before in a prior show one of my buddies ran a Viking up to about fifty five hundred miles and just beat the tar out of it. Went anywhere any of the sport machines would go, and the only thing that it broke in fifty five hundred miles was a was a weld on the muffler. That's it. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, yeah, just, they're, they're, they're pretty much uh, solid. So, but they're slow, but they're definitely slow. I- incredibly slow. I've been behind one on over some trails in Idaho and, and oh, and that's the other thing. They're wide too. Like, you oh, know, yeah, I don't care. I don't huge. care. I don't care what the dimensions say when you're following one, you're looking <laughs> and you're just like, man, where am I going to go around this thing? <laughs> they are wide. They're wide. Um, so yeah, a lot of interesting, uh, things they've done with the cabin. They've made it things a lot more modern. Uh, they have these really interesting, um, brow lights on the front hood. Um, but those aren't the headlights. They're just accent lights. The yeah. actual headlights are down where the X2 headlights are, where it's near the bumper. And so I thought that was an interesting approach because I'm so used to, uh, the more modern UTVs having the headlights up at the, t- near the top of the, the hood. Um, which gives you a little bit more in line of sight angle, whereas down by the bumper gives you a little bit of a lower angle. Um, so I, I, it'd be interesting to see how the the headlights play out with that structure. But I'm excited all the way across the board. You know, anybody that understands power sports knows that. You know, there's a lot of brand honks out there, but at the end of the day, the more that the Japanese OEs are doing with new platforms, all it's going to do is help the market. So anytime they come into the market with some sort of uh, a new vehicle, it's going to create a lot of excitement and it's going to get the the other manufacturers scratching their head and being like, okay, so where are we going next? You know, so it is great to have entities like Can-Am and Polaris out there that nobody's touched the Turbo S yet. Nobody's touched the Pro XP. Nobody's touched the X3 yet from a performance standpoint. I mean, we can argue about what the Talon and the YXZ could be, but it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of work to get those two cars up on that level. Whereas, you know, as it sits right now, this show... And what we do and how we recreate has a very sport-oriented vibe to it. And, For sure. But we definitely want to cover the utility market. But the way that we ride, the where we go, what we want from a performance standpoint, there's only two manufacturers that from the factory we could go turn a key over and get the type of performance that we want. Yeah, if you look at any of the best in the deserts or any of the Bajas, like you're not seeing the other cars out there. You're starting to see a few of the KRXs uh, pop in. Um, but for the most part most part you can see that the the top 50 are are all polaris cam so yeah i mean you see uh, king of hammers king of hammers you know if i if i were to recite the top 10 finishers at king of hammers this last year it was mostly uh, it man, was mostly can am i want to say it was mostly can am maybe a couple of players sprinkled in there but if you go the year prior or the year before that you did see some yxes in there I, I know a couple people that finished in the top 10 in king of hammers on a yxe right they're a tough car but but it's a well it's a a hugely upgraded car. Well, you know, for somebody to want to attack King of Hammers on a YXZ, in my opinion, they're supported by Yamaha because you have advantages by starting out on a Polaris or starting out on a Can-Am that you don't have. I mean, on the YXZ, on the YXZ to go attack something like Hammers, the guys that I know ran a YXZ, they long traveled it, they turboed it, they did a lot of bolt-on stuff. Now, mind you, once that stuff was done, they had a juggernaut. Right. Absolute it's juggernaut car. Oh, my gosh. Just a beautiful machine. It's just so, you know, just so capable. But, I mean, you're talking about for the conventional user and the conventional and a race team to put together a machine that could compete or that could, you know, build a build a Yamaha on that level. You're talking probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for the price of the car. And then you're just you got to double it in order for to sure. get it up there. Uh, so if we talk our max four seater a little bit, um, Interestingly, with the Yamaha platform, the Wolverine platform, um, <laughs> have to. 
Chad just showed up, so the intro the show might take an interesting turn here in a few minutes. Um, Buckle up. The uh, if we take a look at the R Max uh, four seater platform, which is again just an adaptation of the X four platform, uh, it, it it continues the seats in the bed concept where the not wheelbase is only extended three inches. Not a fan. And you're putting people up higher behind you, and then you're increasing the 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 center of gravity height and all those things, and you take up all your bed space because now there's seats in your bed. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people that do have little children that, that makes sense uh, for what they're doing because it's only once in a while and they can <laughs> pop the seats out and, and not have to worry about it. Right. Um, I'd almost get the forest seater just for the extra three inches of wheelbase. Not to haul people, though. But not to haul people. Yeah, I, I don't like how they're protected. I don't like how they're sitting. I understand why they did it. And for a farmer or something or somebody going out to go jump into a duck blind, I have no issue with it whatsoever. I don't have a purpose for something like that. And like I said, when we're out, if I'm out in the mountain trail riding and I'm doing some sort of aggressive riding, that's going to slow me down. It's going to make me take their safety into consideration unless I've done some sort of a real bulletproof cage or anything of that nature. I'm going to probably steer clear of a machine like that or steer clear of just hauling people but i would agree with you i would buy that model for the extra storage x just the extra little bit behind the seat but also just the fact that um you were at under 90 inches i think a wheelbase that's short is for what we do unadvisable um but if you're just somebody that's putting around the, the mountains or doing general utility if, stuff if you're or in the whatever. Hatfield McCoy trail system, that thing's going to be pretty dang cool. If you're on the East coast where yeah. you're not getting over 30 for yeah. most of the stuff you're doing, or you got to turn sharp. Yep. 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 It'll be great. I dig um, it. and so what's interesting, uh, I noticed was that on their spec sheets, the two seater and the four seater had the same turning radius. Uh, so that's I didn't notice curious that, really. to me. Huh. Um, even though, I mean, the wheelbase extension is really not that much. You would expect it to be at least four or six inches wider than the two-seater on the turning radius if you're doing that, but apparently not. So uh, maybe they just uh, the the steering rack and everything it just all kind of mushes out to not yeah. noticeable of a difference. Yeah. No, it's a lot of good stuff to talk about, though, man. I mean, you got to take into consideration if I'm rating stuff on like a one to ten scale. You know, the commander ten, general ten. This is right up there, man. I'm really excited to see how it performs. And if there's one thing that he's used the term and I've used the term what we do. One of the things that we do that we really have to take into consideration is range. And I almost guarantee you that, and this is a smaller tank too. I, I don't, th I think the tank on the R max is 8.5, which most cars are anywhere between 9.5 to 10.5. I still think this car could potentially go like 160 to 175 miles in the mountains where we ride. You know, I mean, if you're going 10 miles an hour and some tight twisties, it's not going to go that far, but on forest service roads, expedition style where you can hold some, where you can hold some pace. Like I think this thing's range is just not, it's going to be a, it's going to have a lot of, uh, it's going to stretch a tank of gas. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to find out what people are getting uh, on their R maxes. If you've, if you've already gotten your R max or if you're out buying one uh, soon, let us know what you're getting as far as fuel economy. It'd be interesting to see how they've uh, managed to, um, you know, push that mileage out on that that kind of proven platform with the bigger bore. Let me take that one step forward, further. If you're in the Pacific Northwest and you get your hands on one of these, come out with us on one of our rides, <laughs> and we'll we'll really see how far that tank will stretch. Because I mean, especially when it's loaded up. Yeah, a hundred percent. Another thing that's interesting about the four seaters is they've mixed up the wheels uh, package on the cars and on the trim packages. They're also mixing up the tire selection as well. So on the uh, two seaters, you're getting, um, I believe they're 10 inches, uh, 10 inch wheels all the way around. And when you go to do a four seater, you're getting the nine and a half up front and the 10 in the back, or, or I have to double check those numbers, but relatively closer it's smaller, uh, uh, width in the front, wider in the back, just like the razors and just like the can ams. Um, so I think that's interesting. I don't, I don't know why you would do it on, on the two seater and change it on the four seater when the four seater is only a three inch longer car. It, it, it kind of, and then, and then on the four seater, you also lose, um, I believe it's, uh, a couple inches of travel on the back, which again is curious to me. I think maybe they had to move the shock placement 
where the top of the shock mounts and thus uh, pushing the shock further in and losing some travel. Right. Um, so it's it'll be curious to see if somebody comes out with a lift kit or something that kind of repositions the shocks to get you that travel back. Um, and then something else I noticed was on the four seater, you don't have a tip bed. On the two seater, you get a tilt bed. Uh, on the four seater, you do not, it's fixed. Yeah, I don't know why anybody with a bed, would, uh, any OE that's offering a bed wouldn't make a tilt bed. That seems like standard. I mean, obviously it's because the seats are back there, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I've been up close on a two seater. There wasn't anything about it I didn't like. It was so cool. Um, and that new kind of almost like olive or army green. It's very similar uh-huh. to what Toyota's doing on their Tacoma TRD Pros right now. And it's matte. I oh, like I it. I love it, dude. It look, it's, one of the, it's one of my favorite colors in UTV for sure. Yeah, it's a very look, good looking car. And it's then not they... an aggressive color, you know, which, you know, seeing a, an X3 or a Turbo S with that color scheme maybe might not jump out of the jump out of the you know it's not going to jump off the jump off the board and be it's not going to jump it's, out it's, of it's, it's yeah. not going to attract you the the way that uh, maybe some of the more aggressive colors would but i i loved it it was cool and so they have that on the xtr edition which comes with the uh the winch uh they have the uh the the base model and then they have the xtr and then they have the premium and uh, the differences between the trims are uh, on the XTR and the premium, you get your drive selection uh, knob. And what that's doing is just changing your throttle response to be uh, more aggressive or less aggressive. It's got IQS too, doesn't it? On the, uh, on the premium. Yeah. The premium has an IQS package where you can select uh, comfort, sport, or trail. So the premium is pretty decked out and As you guys all know, and I'm not saying just pump the brakes and don't go buy this thing right now. You're never going to hear me say that. But a lot of the Japanese OEs come out of the pocket really, really aggressive from a price standpoint between $23,000 to $24,000. And the next thing you know, six months, eight months, 12 months down the line, those $23,000 machines are down to somewhere around $16,000, $18,000. Right. So if you could get that premium with the IQS, with a winch, with all those uh, those gadgets, somewhere around $18,000 to $19,000 a year from now, you're getting a lot of value, in my opinion. Yeah, that was similar to what like the KRX was when it came out. Twenty three at- grand, and you can get it for sixteen now. Well, I wouldn't say now. I would say right after launch they did, and then COVID hit, and everything kind of went to Fair crap. Enough, yeah. Uh, and now trying to find a unit available to buy is yeah proven for- difficult. So nowadays people are buying stuff that's available, not stuff that they love, right. which is really interesting. And I, I would still, you know, speaking to that, I would caution people, if you're in the market for a UTV right now, uh, just give it a month or two, let things settle out, let the election happen, let things kind of just play out. And um, yeah, you're going to miss a couple months of writing, yeah. but I think it'll be worth it to your pocketbook to do that. I think you and I are definitely on the same page. Don't buy something thinking to yourself, I can make that work. Right. You know, n- don't do that. Buy something you love. Yeah, for sure. There's, you know, when you're when you're investing that much money into something that you're going to put your family in, or or you're going to put your life's lot handle, you know, you put your life in. Uh, you don't don't and you're it, the other part of it is that you're going to be in it for a long time. You don't yeah. want to be one that's uncomfortable, the one that doesn't sit right, or the one that has a dead pedal in the wrong spot, or any of those dumb things that would just irritate you to no end once you've gotten it right. Yeah. You're going to find out that this sport, and I hope, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating it, but I hope I'm right. You're going to find out that this sport really, really sinks its hooks in you, and it becomes almost like a lifestyle. So that be, that's why it's so important to buy something you love. And, you know, if you think that you're going to be more trail-oriented, you want to go out and explore, you got a ton of options. But if you want to absolutely rip, there's a few options. So just, you know, if you want to go out and absolutely rip, there's some machines out there that might be available. They might be naturally aspirated. You could wind up with some buyer's remorse. So, And there could just, be some uh, new cars coming out soon that you don't know. The year's not over yet. So, Oh, we haven't caught any hate about talking about that <laughs> sort of stuff. So let's, I wanted to address that. Uh, we've been getting a lot of grief about where's the pro are. You said it wasn't a be here. We don't live in Minnesota. <laughs> so we don't work at the home office. We we want just be really clear here. We said from the get go, this is our best guess. Where do you think that they would have released that? They would have released it at Camp RZR. Yep. When is Camp RZR? These are rhetorical questions. 
So with COVID taking out a lot of these events, taking out Sandsport. Now Sandsport got rescheduled, but I don't even know what, well, my company actually backed out of Sandsport because it kept getting re rescheduled and we're just gonna push it back to next year. Hopefully things yeah. are back to normal. But releases get done at Camp RZR, get done at Sandsport, be patient. Yeah, so they, camp, they canceled the Camp Razor uh, and the replacement for that has all been either digital or these like micro industry events. And uh, at the last one, which was a couple weeks ago from the date of recording this, um, basically they said we have something uh, really big in October that we want you to be aware about, but we're not going to uh, release it to the public yet. So um, that's what the people that attended that uh, event were told. Um, and I'm sure they were told a lot more, uh, sure. but we don't know that. And when we were, when we put out the information on the pro R, we took everything we knew about the car. Cause we know the car is there. Like that's not a question. The car is there. And Polaris has even put out pictures of that car. And we posted that picture of the car. And then they we? told <laughs> let's speak. Uh, I put, I, I posted a picture of the car to which then their lawyers quickly told me I was not allowed to do so. Uh, and they pulled it off their media site. So it was a mistake on their, on their marketing team's side. It wasn't supposed to go out. Uh, I published it because it was on there and it was on the published day of their new vehicles. Uh, and so I took the media package and went with it and, uh, quickly realized that I was, uh, both the beneficiary and <laughs> the 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 guy on the receiving end of a lawyer phone call. So um, so to Polaris, if you're out there listening, I apologize. It was in your media packet. It was on product launch day. I went with it, and uh, and I hope no one's feelings were hurt uh, by that. It was just simply uh, lack of communication, and uh, Polaris has not been known for their great overwhelming amount of community communication before a product launch so well i can tell you my feelings are hurt and my feelings are hurt because i don't own that machine of, of which those pictures were taken because it looks absolutely epic so something that's come up over the last couple of days that somebody uh in the groups had reminded me of was the red bull ot3 so last year at the dakar rally over in saudi arabia the red bull team had their uh their polaris razor uh cars in the race and then they had this custom built OT3 vehicle. And we had posted, uh, you know, at that time uh, that this was an interesting car because it had the, the, at the time, the new Pro Razor headlights <coughs> on the car. And we didn't know if that was some sort of like requirement by Dakar to have certain a number of OE parts on it or something um, because there was no Razor branding on it, but there was Razor headlights on it. And uh, interestingly, now that the Pro R uh, details have started to come out, that car is in line, geometry wise and component wise, in line with what we know of the Pro R, uh, the OT3 and the, o and, the R and the Pro R. So if you take a look at the OT3, take off all the Dakar stuff, the, the, the custom frame, the wrap, the side Plastics. panels, the... Um, the custom billet hubs, all that stuff. And you just look at the car for what it is. Uh, that's kind of what you can expect in the pro R it has, it's going to have those lower AR mounted front shocks. It's going to have the longer wheelbase. Uh, if you look at the OT three, it has, uh, the engine completely concealed. So you can't see what it is. And in the Dakar rally, there could be an argument that you could say, well, it's to protect it from the environment, but you're going through sand, you're going through desert as we know from Baja and best in the desert and all these other races, you don't need to protect the engine while you're racing. And, uh, if you look at it, you can see that through the side of the wheel well shroud they put in there. Uh, you can see the exhaust coming out the side, just like we saw on the, the pro R slingshot motor leaks that we've seen. So I'm pretty sure that that motor in that vehicle was the preliminary test bed for what we're going to see coming out next month. Yeah, Polaris does a lot of tinkering and a lot of R&D. You know, I, I know a couple marketing guys that have uh, one of them actually selling his car right now. He had a Turbo S four-seater, 
And it's a little bit of a Frankenstein. It was a, what What year are we in? 2020? His was a 2019. I don't know what year you were in. Oh, dude. I, <laughs> but I, I'm in 2020. I, I quit keeping count after 2012. But uh, <laughs> he had a Pro XP clutch system on his Turbo S. You know, and it, like I said, it was kind of a Frankenstein. And he got it at a great deal just based on the fact that uh, Polaris had been doing some R&D and got him involved in some of the R&D process. Uh, he took it down, did a lot of pre-running, like at Baja, does a lot of desert riding down in Southern California and stuff. But, you know, I can tell you right now, one of Polaris's premier race race teams, you know, they they were operating a Turbo S four seater for some BITD stuff, and it had some uh, it had some parts that, that Polaris wanted to test out on right. it, like uh, Pro uh, not Pro R, but uh, Turbo or Pro XP parts <laughs> on it. That. Yeah. So it, it is interesting how they kind of do some R&D stuff. And it would be kind of cool to see some behind the scenes on that sort of stuff. Hint, hint. <laughs> if anyone's listening. Yeah. Uh, so we talked to George Hamill on the last podcast about kind of the R&D and the racer involvement in that. And, you know, he was saying with Yamaha that, you know, his his race program was essentially uh, the the beta testing for all the parts. Yeah. And, uh, and it affected his race program because of it. Yeah. But... Um, but it's interesting you brought up the clutches because when the Pro XP launched, they said, we got this new clutch. It's awesome. You can service it, adjust the weights and all that without taking it off the car. Uh, and it's going to be compatible with the, with the, 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 Pro, the, the XP turbos. Like it's going to be able to bolt on. You'll just have a different bolt holding it on. Uh, but it would go on to the drive shaft. So uh, it's funny that, that you say that because lately... I mean, the last six months, I've not heard a peep from Polaris on anything saying that that clutch was compatible. And I don't know if that has to do with maybe some of the exploding clutch issues that they've had over the last year with the, the initial launch of the Pro um, or whatever. But uh, it's interesting that I haven't heard a, a single word about the compatibility on that clutch uh, after launch. So, um, But speaking of George Hamill, we had him on the podcast. That was pretty epic. Yeah, that was a great show. Hopefully you got a chance to check it out. Yeah, so if any of you guys out there haven't listened to or, or watched, I, I suggest you watch it um, if you can uh, in the in the background of the garage or whatever. But uh, one of the more powerful podcasts I've listened to or been a part of in the last year or two years. Yeah, he's got a really unique story, uh, an inspiring story. The guy, the guy just, you know, he, he's been through so much. He's still here. I mean, just such a positive attitude. You know, such a positive guy, and just it, it, it got to the point where when we were having that dialogue, whether where it was kind of like you're just shaking your head, it's just almost like overwhelming that he's gone through what he has, he's still here, he's still kicking, and now he's giving back to the community and just uh, talking points about the industry that he loves, which is racing. And uh, I hope we get to cross paths with him again. And I can tell you right now, if you didn't check out the show, he and Shock Therapy Polaris are going to be having a crack at the UTV Worlds here in a couple of weeks. And, you know, on behalf of the guys up in the Pacific Northwest, man, we're wishing them all the luck. We want to see them go out there and have fun. Most importantly, have fun. Yeah. Have some success as well, but uh, stay safe, have fun. So the UTV World Championship, if you haven't listened to that episode, uh, took him out. He, he wrecked pretty something fierce. And then, uh, well, he actually didn't wreck fierce. He got hit <clears throat> by a car while he was outside of his car. Uh, and it wrecked his body up pretty good. So uh, he's going back this year with a bunch of uh, vendor partners that have, are encouraging him. He's building an RS1 uh, build, which I think is really awesome. Um, and <clears throat> after the after the Worlds, uh, hopefully we'll have some time with him to talk about the car and how it performed and kind of the takeaways that he got from the car. Uh, he, he started off in Razor 900s, went to 1000s, moved to Yamaha YXZs, and now is back on the CVT train with the RS1. So um, it'll be interesting to see kind of his perspective after a full number of years with the YXZ and then going back to uh, the Polaris platform and then something that's a little bit different, the RS1. So uh, look forward to that and uh, look forward to more sh talks with him and, and meeting him up on the show circuit or whatever. Uh, and maybe, you know, if someday he can make it up here into the woods, we can take him for a good uh, overland trip. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah. He, his show is so worth checking out, too. I mean, if you if you got a passion for racing, you love racing across all moto disciplines. If it involves dirt, he's talking about it. And he's got some very, very competent people that he brings in. And he himself, in, in his life, raced at an absolute elite level. 
So he, he's a great guy to check out. So he definitely just, check uh, out. his last uh, episode, he had RJ Anderson on right awesome. after his, uh, his win um, over last weekend. And uh, they also uh, kind of like a re-release of the XP1K3 uh, uh, behind the scenes video. And so they all talked about that. So if That's you're awesome. interested in kind of just those um, top level athletes or the racing circuit or any of that stuff he has he's getting he, involved with them he has a lot of those guys on the show every week and he's live every monday at 6 p.m pacific so yeah and the way he produces his broadcast too is really neat you know i'll just get a notification online or something that uh, every now and then that that he's live so i'll i try to check it out as much as i can but i'm often doing exactly what i'm doing which is <laughs> Driving, driving, working, <laughs> multitasking. So, uh, so, so his show is kind of a, a live platform where it's just kind of them sitting in chairs talking to people, and uh, you can get involved on Facebook, chat with them, to ask questions, things like that. So, check them out. It's a good show, uh, and if you're at all curious about the UTV racing or the athletes involved, uh, that'll be right up your alley. So, um, what else happened? Uh, you just got back from UTV Takeover Oklahoma. How'd that yeah, go? I, st I still have dirt on my truck from Oklahoma. It's still covered in red dirt. Yeah, it looks like we're heading into rain, so it's probably not going to be gone on there very much longer. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of a last minute decision to make it down to Oklahoma. I kind of put that together in about eight days, somewhere in there, and got a couple things on the X3 done down in Oklahoma you know I didn't even get a chance to do any wrenching on the X on the X3 prior to the event because I mean you, you were here you saw it I mean visibility in some sections was less than a quarter mile we had so much smoke up here from the wildfires let's just put it this way when I left the Pacific Northwest to drive to Oklahoma for this event I never got out of smoke yeah never once and it was it, it sad state of affairs yeah, I uh, put an air filter in the, the house's HVAC, and in two days, it looked darker than a Hershey's chocolate bar. Wow. But uh, takeover, you went. Uh, you set up the, the full throttle setup over there. Um, but uh, a bunch of personalities showed up. Uh, yeah, it was epic. You know, we had uh, Blake Wilkie was out there. Al McBeth was out there. Set a new world record. Massive. Man, that guy's just, he's So incredible. 215 was the new sand jump record, yeah. right? Yeah, that guy, you know. There is so many people out there, and I'm just, just going to say it. There's so many people out there trying to do what that guy does. And maybe they don't understand what it is that he puts in to do what he does. You know, in terms of building a machine in the Pacific Northwest, he's one of the best. Suspension, he's one of the best. He's working with the best companies. And it doesn't help to, or it doesn't hurt either that he absolutely knows what he's doing. And, you know, guys are out there chasing and... As if you're following media, we've seen some guys back east get hurt yeah. trying to do Al stuff. And, you know, Al's the man. <laughs> Al's the man. And it's, it's, it's a result. It's a result of a lot of hard work. I mean, that guy, that guy works his butt off. And it's, it's just it was so cool to see him take that down. I think he took down his own record, didn't he? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, I got the crowd going, that's for sure. And they had, a, they had a really nice setup out there. You know, they had a huge kicker that he jumped off of, and he had a great great spot to land. So it just kind of all, it all, um, it all came together for him. So congratulations, man. So they had, uh, if you're not familiar with the takeover events, they have a number of things going on, including uh, UTV barrel racing, uh, mud bogs, um, mud racing. Hillfest, uh, which Hillfest is... Hillfest is a little bit hard to describe if you've never done that kind of riding. Essentially, it's it's side hilling. It's almost like you're side hilling in a snowmobile, but on a snowmo on a side by side in sand. Uh, that's that's the driver's race right gotcha. there. Gotcha. That is that is legit. So, so is it an actual competition or is it just a, a free, a free it's a, for all? It's a timed event. They put cones on the side of hills and essentially you drop down into those things. You sent, you're you're letting the car drift into them. You power out of it. And it, it, it's, a, it's a very specific talent that takes to compete at that level. And I don't have, from a competitive standpoint, I don't really feel the, need, the urge to go short course race and jump in. Wheelie Fest sounds fun. Wheelie, <laughs> Wheelie Fest sounds like a lot of fun. They have Wheelie Hill, Comps. They yeah, have... But Hill Fest, Hill Fest is, is something that I want to play around on my X3. Tur uh, Polaris is, the Polarises are the ones that dominated it last year. And I think a lot of it's just based on the way that the Polaris turbos make power. You know, it's all down low. And I think that's really, really beneficial. But 
I'm going to play around at Winchester Bay. I'm going to play around at Coos Bay on some side hills and, and play around with my car and, and see what kind of setup Hill Fest looks like a lot of fun. If I were to get involved in an event, it'd be that one. You know, you think Oklahoma, you think... Uh, you don't think sand dunes. You don't think sand dunes. Yeah. But uh, it seems like they have a pretty epic uh, setup over there. Um, side-by-side blog guys were over there. Uh, the Side-by-side USA guys were out there doing a laser show, which yeah, was pretty they, cool. They had us all in the same camp spot. Yeah. 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 So anyways, uh, UTV Takeover, uh, awesome, awesome event. You should check it out. And uh, it's going to be coming up here to the Northwest. We'll be heading up to Coos Bay here not too long. I think we're less than two weeks, buddy. Yeah. You so, get stoked. This is your first one. Uh, first Takeover, not my first uh, Oregon Dune show, but uh, first Takeover event. And uh, the guys that run that operation are top-notch guys. And uh, it seems like everything that they're they're doing with that uh, show is, is, is awesome. So Yeah, they put that event together with a lot of love, man. And it's a lot of love for this industry. And I make the joke often to those guys that they put the event together as an excuse to party and that's <laughs> you know i it, it's it's true but it's not true <laughs> you know i'm just kind of i'm joking around about that but it, it's they're so passionate about making sure that people have a great time putting together these events kind of seeing the wild stuff that transpires at these events and i'm telling you man it's just it's amazing and, and this in particular this oklahoma event is so unique as it relates to the other events, because Vendor Rose downtown, they close off an entire town to, uh, to host this event. And if you can picture small town America, small town America like a small farm town, that's where this is at. You just have this 1,500 acre sand section out in the middle of Oklahoma with a small town adjacent to it. And, you know, you got these, all, all these brick mom and pop buildings all over the place. And they just set up vendor row throughout this area, and it's just going to grow. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, I, the dunes themselves aren't 1,500 acres can get absorbed up really, really quickly. Yeah. And uh, But the event is it's so top-notch. You know, I, I'm stoked that you're going to go to take over in Coos Bay. It's going to look a little different potentially because it did get rescheduled from June to October because of COVID. I, you think still, the dunes it, will be blown out? Dude, it's still going to be sold out, first and foremost. It is sold out. And uh, as far as the dunes being blown out, here's the, here's the big secret. If you ever want to ride Oregon dunes, and uh, don't get ticked at me, golfers golf Bandon Dunes, which Bandon Dunes is 30 miles south of Coos Bay, and it's one of the most famous municipality courses in the United States. People golf that course in October because that's when the winds are down. Gotcha. So some of the best riding to be had on the Oregon coast is between mid to late September to Thanksgiving. So there it is. As far as conditions go, I think the conditions are going to be awesome. As far as the turnout goes, like I said, it's sold out. It's going to be, it should be by all accounts, should be amazing. And by sold out, we're talking about like the campgrounds There's and things nothing. like that around yep. the event. Yep. And uh, so if you're, if you're wanting to go, you're going to need to do some calling plan on a full day. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but the nice thing that uh, about TakeOver is they're not charging you to get in the door. No. And, uh, you know, so many of the shows in the industry are ticketed plus vendor fees plus promo fees plus everything else. Ticketed on vendor fees, and you touched on it yesterday. They're ticketing, they're charging vendor fees for areas that you and I could go ride for free any other time of the year. Right. And that's not what TakeOver is all about, man. They're about your experience. Yeah, and I think that uh, if uh, Steve and guys are, are listening, uh, keep it that way. I think that's yeah. one of the reasons why you're successful. Um, there's other there's other events that charge, and and that's the first thing that people complain about yeah. is is the fees because a family of four, you know, they're spending a few hundred bucks just to show up to a place that they you know a day earlier yeah. we're riding for free. Yeah, there's some there's some industry uh, a lot of industry insiders and industry guys that make stuff happen. Uh Steve McCarthy, Jim Mc, McIntyre, they're they're two of them that I look forward to seeing every time I rub elbows with them I'm I'm just pumped. You know, it's just it's so you're going to meet them and when you do you're going to just see that enthusiasm kind of oozing out of them. They they love what they're doing. Yeah, so 
good uh, good events to go to. There's some other ones. There's Takeover uh, San Hollow. Uh, that's a new event, and that, that that sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and there's other industry events that are trying to you know scrap it up to to make it happen still this year. So um, if your local dealer or your local brand um, or whatever are trying to put something on just to try to uh, you know give back to the community and give back something that was lost because of COVID, you know, yeah. go out and support them, like do That's, what you can. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's funny that you touched on that. That, that is ab- absolutely popping up more and more uh, kind of mom and pop ventures to get, I mean, every week there seems like some sort of ride in the Pacific Northwest that somebody's putting together and I'm no different. I've done the same thing. I put together some rides and, and they've generated a lot of interest. People, people definitely want to get out of the house. So when you do be safe, but uh, yeah, well, I think we're all ready for this COVID crap to be over with. Yeah, for sure. And and if you have the opportunity, you know, don't blow all your COVID money on every on on one thing. Like, spread some of that love. Give your local businesses some love, and uh, give Amazon a break. They can they could use one less purchase. Um, so, uh, anyways, anything else you want to cover? Um, yeah, I mean, you wanted to cover takeover a little bit. Yep. Yeah, like I think that um, I think that. You know, the Oklahoma event, it's absolutely worth checking out in 2021, no question about it. If You know, we covered the fact that it's going to get bigger and bigger. And don't be surprised whatsoever if the OEs are out there next year taking people on group rides. Um, there were a few companies that, had, that bagged out just at the last minute um, for COVID reasons or business reasons. I think it was actually business reasons because what's weird is right now, from an industry standpoint, everybody's five weeks out on everything. Right. You know, it's just... Parts are hard to come by. Things are going nuts. Uh, It's hard to come by pretty much any sort of component that you need for your rig. Um, But I could not say enough about Oklahoma. Oklahoma was the busiest show I've ever been to in my entire life. It doesn't matter if it was direct business, end user stuff, people kicking tires, um, networking, the whole ball of wax. It was literally about... 7 to 8 a.m. until about midnight to 1 to 2 in the uh, 1 to 2 a.m. And that's how it is in Coos Bay for me too. Like, I, I'm usually done shaking hands about 1 to 2 in the morning. So how it's, was that it's uh, a pretty night incredible. ride? <laughs> 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 so I, uh, one of my coworkers, stayed back at the camp, stayed back at Vendor Row. And I said, all right, I'm going to go check out, uh, check out the dunes, see what the scenes looks like, because I hadn't rode them at night. And I go out there, and I'm trying to find the night ride, and I can't find anything. And I get up on, uh, on top of a dune, and at this point, I'm just looking for some locals. You know, locals know the terrain, and I'm looking for some guys that are ripping. I f- see a few people. They're not ripping. I jump behind a couple people. They're not really ripping. They're just kind of doing their thing. So I, I, I throw in the towel and I get back up on top of a dune. And I find a group that's, they're, they're moving okay. I get behind them. I start wheeling with them. And one of them breaks an axle. So I hop out of the car. And it turns out they were from Dallas. Super nice crew. Uh, talk to them for about 10 to 20 minutes. And I get a text message from my coworker. It says, hey, we're in a cornhole tournament back at the, back at the <laughs> vendor row. I'm like, hey, I'm on my way. What the heck? Yep. So I, I 86 out of there and I start working my way back towards the exit and I found the night ride. Night ride comes around and when the night ride comes around and you're pointed at them, get out of their way. Yeah. So I give them a wide, wide berth and I start heading off to what will be the west and moving my way north. And this night ride, I mean, it's not like Glamis, you know, 10,000, you know, what is it, 1,500 cars, 10,000 cars, I don't even know. Um, it's not like Glamis. And it's not like Oregon, because Oregon, Oregon's night ride is almost seven miles, somewhere in there, and the, and the train will go for seven miles easily. This one was huge, though. I mean, it was 500-plus cars. I'm, I'm speculating. I mean, I heard one guy say 500. I heard another guy say 900. I believe both of them. <laughs> so as I'm giving them a wide berth, I'm watching these guys, and they dune ride you know, this, this industry is, is ascending so much that we have so many new people in this industry that you see it. You see it out on sand. I mean, I'm following people that are on paddles getting stuck going up dunes. And I'm on a pair of Maxxis Liberties that are bald. Bald. <laughs> so I don't even have dune tires. I'm going around them like they're holding still. And as I'm coming around the night ride, I'm like, this is just too epic. 
I got to flip a 180 and I got to get in on this. So I do. I flip it. And, and coincidentally, uh, Wilkie, Blake told me he was three quarters of the way back. I don't know how we didn't run into each other. <laughs> I was so bummed that we didn't. But if somebody told me that I passed 50 cars, I'd believe them. If somebody told me that I passed 90 cars, I'd believe them. I was absolutely all over the gas. The interior heat of my car has never been hotter. <laughs> the, the temperature gauge was actually two points higher than it, or one, one point higher than it normally is. The cab heat was ridiculous, and it was 65 degrees outside. Mind you, I'm not on my paddles at all, and I'm clipping off cars just one after another, just bang, 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 having so much fun. And I was only in the night ride four minutes, at four to five minutes, and I'm telling you, man, 1,500 acres gets absorbed up very quickly when you're hauling butt. And next thing you know, I'm out, you know, night ride's over, four to five minutes later, somewhere in that ballpark. And I get, I look at my rear view mirror, there's at least 15, maybe 12 to 15 cars that are now holding my pace. And, you know, they were in the line, they were following the leader, and they see this dude go by at like, Mach 9, and they're just like, <laughs> hey, if he can do it, I can do it. I was so pumped. Which is not necessarily so the case. If you don't have a 3R tune and an X3, you, you don't necessarily keep up when you... But, but these were like pro, you know, these were XP Pros. These were Turbo S's. So they're a capable car, yeah. for sure. I mean, they can handle that kind of terrain. And it was so cool to see guys holding that pace. So what they probably saw was, uh, oh, that guy's, that guy's riding aggressively. He's riding safely. Maybe I can, too. Let right. me just follow him for a while. And, dude, I'm telling you, when it comes to motocross, I got faster by riding with faster riders. Right. And, and I'm not saying that I'm fast. I would never disrespect somebody that is fast by saying that I'm fast. But, you know, passing 50 to 90 cars in the night ride, obviously, obviously I'm riding faster than they are. And the fact that they picked up, you know, these gr this group picked up the pace to, to, to basically keep me in their sights just pumped me up so much. I, I hope they had a blast. So it was uh, it was one of the funnest rides I've ever been on in a UTV, and I'm not even exaggerating. It was it was incredible. Yeah, one of the things that we both really enjoy is the idea of helping people experience something they haven't experienced before. For sure, for sure. And uh, that, that's a, such a great feeling to have somebody just be totally stoked, whether that be dune riding, whether that be trail riding up a steeper hill than normal, whether that be rock crawling over something they thought they couldn't do. Yeah. You know, that's all part of the experience. And uh, the more you can get out and, and try, the more you can get out with an experience, um, the more you can get out with other people and, and try different styles of riding that you're not normally used to. Um, I'm all for it. So, yeah. And, and it's interesting how people get adrenaline going. Like when I sand ride, I can go out there and run my car real hot, run it really, really aggressive. It doesn't get my adrenaline going. It's fun. It's just pure stoke, 100%, just stoke the whole time. But it doesn't get my adrenaline going. When I'm by myself or in a small group, what gets my adrenaline going is I'll be at the top of a dune, and I'll see a chute disappear into the trees. And I'm just I'm scratching my head as to whether or not my car will even fit on it, much less make it, you know, make it out of it. I, at one point or another, I'm just like, you know what? I'm done thinking about it. Hop in the car and we attack it and find out that not only will my car fit, but it'll, it'll find its way back out. And by the time I get out of it and realize that I've made it, that I, I'm not going to get cliffed out. I'm not going to get, it's not too narrow for me. And I'm not stuck because if you get stuck, boy, are you in a pickle in some of those shoots like out at Winchester Bay. That's the stuff that gets my adrenaline going, really gets my adrenaline going. Yeah. That night ride, that night ride really got my adrenaline going. And what <laughs> it is, it's battling. Right. And we ride, we ride with people that when you battle them, they get uncomfortable. Right. You know, they, they get uncomfortable. They don't like it. Um, my advice, embrace it, man. Don't let somebody battle you, force you to ride over your head. That's something that you have to keep into your, keep in mind. But when you're out there battling, man, just embrace it and have fun. You know, put, you know, if you're out there pushing it a little bit and if you feel like they're faster than you, then let them by and then hold their pace. You right. know, it's, it doesn't have to be all competitive, man, especially like in a night ride type situation where it's not supposed to be, com it's not supposed to be too competitive. But if you come across faster people, pace them. Yeah. For sure, pace them. See what they're doing. See what lines they're taking. See, you know, you can hear their motor. You can, you can see, you can see the where their their car is reacting and know how it is that they're driving. And if you learn something from it, dude, it's what it's all about. And if they don't die, you don't die. 
<laughs> There's something to that. Something like that. Yeah. So, anyways, we've uh, had a great time the last week doing a whole bunch of different stuff. We got a ton of stuff on the books to take care of coming uh, real quick. Uh, we've been putting out more podcasts. We've been or, uh, and and vlogs. We've been catching up on that stuff. Uh, it just dropped the latest vlog about the Berserker tires that went on the Razor on the Idaho trip. So go check that out. We have a long term review coming for those. We got a whole bunch of reviews coming up uh, quickly. I got a ton of of camera work and editing work to do. Um, but uh, for sure, check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Uh, we're itching up on that thousand mark. Maybe yeah. we'll do something special there. Uh, but we really want you guys to subscribe there because we're going to be putting a lot of focus on the video content uh, in the coming months. And uh, for sure, you're going to want to check that out. You know what you just touched on, too? Uh, we, I, I'm in the busiest stretch of my career. I've been in the battery industry for 20, 20 years, and I've never been busier than I am right now. And you and I finally got to do a little catching up. And you were talking about some stuff that you wanted to start tackling in 2021. I'm so pumped. Like, I'm so pumped for what we're after, you know, in terms of where we're going, in terms of what we want to shoot. It's, it's not about, it's almost documentary type stuff. Yeah. And, and that's exciting, you know, because you you're no stranger to having a camera in your hand. You love it. I'm the same way. And uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. The biggest hurdle I have is, do I get behind the wheel or behind the camera? <laughs> it, so, it, but and we're laughing about it, but it's a totally legit problem. It, it's a it real really stressor. Is. It is for sure. You know, I mean, I you and I have gone on some rides and just had an epic time, and then realized, man, we didn't get anything <laughs> for sure. You know. So, anyways, uh, check us out on YouTube.com/slash Side by Side Guys. Uh, also, make sure to join the podcast. Subscribe to your favorite podcast app. Uh, we're on all of them. Uh, the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast, um, and uh, check out the the interview with George Hamill last week. That was really great. Um, check out our website. We're always going to be posting uh, new stuff there. So we posted all the R Max specs there. So if you're interested in the R Max, uh, check out the website side by side guys dot com. Um, and uh, yeah, we just got a ton of stuff going on. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're on all of those things. And uh, we have personal accounts. Follow Ian's yep. personal account, my personal account. We are always posting goosey stuff. I posted a picture of my dog looking over the laptop last night. So, uh, you know, there's stuff that happens and, and we're people that do things and you know, yeah, stuff I mean, like that. So if you're following uh, the respective media that we're all a part of, you're going to see where we're at. You yeah. know, it's, I always joke around uh, about some of the influencers that we work with. If you need to find them, the way that you find them is by way of their Instagram stories. You and I are kind of turning into that a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, we're definitely going to be more involved yeah. uh, as time goes, as we get more practice and just more part of our natural habits. Um, and, uh, yeah, tons of content coming. Check it out. And uh, if you have a, a buddy, a, a side-by-side buddy that, you know, you go ride with or whatever, just throw them, throw them a link. Say, hey, check these guys out. They're doing cool stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're looking for more vendor uh, partners. We're looking for more uh, community partners, event partners. We want to be um, a voice and a, and a production uh, for the community. So um, if you have ideas for us, let us know. Send us a DM. We respond there. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions that are more like, uh, you know, discussive and you want to send us an email, info at sidebysideguys.com. And, uh Anyways, we, we just look forward to hearing from everybody. Feedback's always welcome. Criti critical feedback's always welcome. And uh, we hope... I can be really condescending. Be careful how you come at us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm hilarious. Everybody knows this. So, <laughs> so uh, we just really enjoy uh, spending the time to do the fun things out in the community and seeing people and, and having those stories to discuss. And so if you have a, a story, uh, you know, hit us up. And uh, if you have a product, hit us up. If you've got a, an event coming up, hit us up. We're, you got an RMAX 1000 that you want us to go test out? Definitely hit us up. <laughs> I, I, Until I, the I, next time, guys, peace. <laughs>